Well, good morning. I hope that, that you're doing well this morning. And uh, hard to believe it's Wednesday already, although by some of your yawns, uh, I know that it is getting to the middle of the week and uh, the, the pace and the schedule uh, is a bit tiring. How many of you say a little bit tired this morning? All right. Woo. All right. I'll do my best to keep you awake. You try to do your part. I'll try to do my part. But I, I will be praying for all of us that, uh, that God's grace will strengthen us uh, for all the work that's to come today, all the joy that's to come today, the fun, uh, but all that, that God has in store for this day. So I have learned many times in life that God's grace works best in our weakness. And so when we are weak and we are tired, uh, it is a great place to rely on God's strength and God's mercy. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever been amazed by something or someone? Have you ever just been in a situation where you found something absolutely amazing? Anybody? All right. Yeah, all of us, all of us, and we could all tell our stories. What is the first thing that you think about when you hear the word amazing? I, I want us to just do this together. So I'm going to count to three. I want you to get that thought. What, just what pops in your mind when you think of amazing? And then let's all just say it together. One, two, three. Jesus. All right. That sounded a little more interesting than I thought. Amazing, obviously, is a word that we come to associate with God. Right? We sang earlier this week uh, that hymn that Charles Gabriel wrote. Right? I stand, what? Amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. What amazed him that he could love a sinner like me, condemned, unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. We have been on a journey where we are considering this Hebrew word of hesed a word we find almost 250 times in the Old Testament, a word that God used to describe his very nature and his very character. It is a word that describes his loyal, faithful, covenant love. It's a word that describes his mercy and his compassion, his kindness, his truth. It's a word that we are discovering this week, while not explicit in the New Testament, is found everywhere in the New Testament because Jesus the Son of God, God himself, wrapped in humanity, is the embodiment of this very word, this very thing that we call chesed. And we have been looking at the New Testament, we've been looking at Jesus to discover how this amazing truth, this amazing word can impact our lives as we embrace it, as we understand it, and as we live it out. In the Gospel of Luke, and we were there earlier this week on Monday, in fact, we're going to go back to the same chapter. So you have your Bible, I would invite you to find Luke chapter 7, uh, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 this morning. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is, is written by the man himself named Luke uh, that we know as a companion of the Apostle Paul, as a physician. And Luke was not an eyewitness to Jesus' life, his ministry, and so, how did Luke write his gospel? Well, Luke tells us how he did it, that he interviewed eyewitnesses, that he set, he said, in his heart and his mind, as the Holy Spirit inspired him, to set an account, an orderly account of Jesus' life and ministry. And in order to do that, he interviewed, he talked to the witnesses, to the people that were there, and he listened to them. He heard their stories. And again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as God inspired him, he writes his gospel. And one of the words... That, that Luke uses over and over again. In fact, he uses many forms. In the Greek language, there are about seven words that can be used to translate the idea of being amazed or astonished or to, to stand in awe. And Luke uses all seven of those words in his gospel. Sometimes he uses them uh, twice in one sentence. Think about it, just, just as you jog your memory a little bit this morning, the shepherds, Right? when they heard the announcement of Jesus' birth and it was revealed to them that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, they were, anybody remember, amazed. Joseph and Mary were amazed. Those in Nazareth were described as being astonished, even though many of them did not believe. In Capernaum as well, Luke describes the people of God as being amazed at Jesus. And so... We, we step back and recognize that we too should stand amazed, right? That God would choose to love 
someone like me. You know, I, I think about, about the fact that, that God saved me at an early age. And when God saved me, he knew everything about me. Not just my past, right? And, and as, a, as a child, I, I had a past. But he knew all the times that I would fail him. He knew all the times that I would fall short. He knew the times that, whether through word or action, I would even deny him. And yet he chose to save me anyway. And God never regrets his choice. He doesn't regret choosing you. He doesn't regret saving you. He's not ashamed of you. And that ought to cause us to stand amazed. How could God love me like that? A sinner who does not deserve it. Chesed is the understanding that the one who, from whom I deserve nothing delights to give me everything. And in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, we're going to see something extraordinary. Because in this chapter, Luke is going to tell us about a time not where people were amazed by Jesus and his love and his message, but he's going to tell us about a time that Jesus was amazed. Right? We sing about amazing grace, but in this passage, we're going to see Jesus marvel at amazing grace faith. And so Luke chapter 7 and verse 1, and we'll, we'll start with just the first five verses, really an extraordinary and amazing scene, a fascinating scene, as pretty much all of the, 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 the narratives that we have of Jesus's life are. But it says, when he had concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. And a centurion servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. And when they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy for you to grant this, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And so this scene that Luke is painting for us here is one of uh, Jesus entering Capernaum, where much of his ministry was based out of, and this Roman centurion, this Roman soldier, has heard that Jesus is in the area, and he sends him message, a message, a message that his servant is ill, is sick, is dying, and he wants Jesus to come and to heal him. Now, this ought to get our attention, right? You know, there, there are things in life that, that get our attention. This is, this is very unusual for a couple of reasons. First of all, this man is a Gentile. This man's a Roman. He's definitely an outsider. And yet we are given some information in the text that he is someone who has come to believe in the God of Israel. He's someone who's come to recognize that there was a God who created the world, and he's come to know him, and he has faith in him, and he is probably in many ways not fully converted to Judaism, but a proselyte, he's practicing the things, he's, he's fasting, he's praying, he's giving to the poor, he's doing the things that the Jewish people did. And so he's heard about Jesus. Now we don't know if he has heard him personally, if he's heard his message, or he's just heard of him, of testimony, but he's heard that there's this Jewish rabbi who is different from every other Jewish rabbi that he's ever heard about. His message is different, and not only that, he does miracles. He has a power that is extraordinary. And this Roman centurion asks for Jesus to come. It's also extraordinary because in this day and time, Roman soldiers, Roman centurions, were not known about caring for their people. Right? To care for your servant, to actually care if he lived or died, meant something, something had happened in this man's heart. This, this is not your average Roman soldier. Not only that, but notice that that in, in verses 4 and 5, that when these elders that he sent, these Jewish leaders, come to him, they pleaded with him earnestly. They, they, you know, and, and we all know what it's like to plead earnestly. When we want something really bad, how many of you have ever wanted something really bad from your parents and you pleaded for it? You begged. All right, how many of you got what you asked for? All right, most of you, right? As parents, right, we do want to, to give... Uh, honor to your request. We, we want to do those things. We can't always do that. But we know what it's like to plead, to beg. And 
They're begging, they're pleading. And notice the basis for their, their pleading. They said, this man is worthy for you to come. Jesus, this isn't your average Roman centurion. He, he is, he's a man of faith. He fasts, he prays, he's generous to the poor. And not only that, he gave a huge contribution to the synagogue here. In fact, we wouldn't have a synagogue if it wasn't for his generous financial donation. This man is worthy of your time. This man is worthy of your attention. This man is worthy of you coming and honoring his request. You see, in their minds, the way they understood God was that that those who are worthy or deserving had a right to expect something from God. They, They thought that that if you were doing the right things, if you were living the right kind of life, if you were keeping the rules, if you were doing the things, we talked yesterday about the externals, that if you were doing those things, that you were good and that you deserved, you had a right to expect something from God. That was their understanding. They assumed that this is how God worked. It's what they believed. It was an honest belief, although, as we will see, a misguided belief. Notice verse 6. Jesus went with them. Aren't you grateful that Jesus is so gracious? Jesus could have immediately given these guys a lecture. What do you mean he's worthy? No one is worthy. No one is righteous, guys. No, not one, right? Are, are you with, like, what do you mean he's worthy? Can you, I can't believe you people, right? Are you with me? Right? How many of you are Jesus might have been a little bit like that, right? Right? A little bit of what's wrong with you? What do you mean he's worthy? No one's worthy. You guys, how come you guys don't get it yet? But no, he just goes with them patiently. And it says, when he was not far from the house, verse 6, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now we see this extraordinary contrast. Somehow word has has gotten to him that Jesus is on his way. Probably he got a text from the elders. Are you with me? Right? Oh, Jesus, we we got Jesus, and we pleaded, we begged, and he's coming. You know, get everything in order. Jesus is coming to your house. Now, we all know that they didn't have cell phones, just like you. (laughs) See, you're more like Jesus than you realize, (laughs) at least when you're here. Of course, they didn't have cell phones, but word still was, you know, it always amazes me when you read the Bible or other, like, word, even though they didn't have technology, and they didn't have transportation. They still had the ability. To, words still spread quickly. And somehow, someone has gone ahead, probably ran ahead, and let him know. And when the centurion hears that Jesus is actually coming, and maybe, he, you know, maybe in his mind he never actually really believed that this would actually happen, that he actually would come. But now he's, he, he, he's like, I, I, can't, I, I don't want Jesus to even come to my house. I don't want him to trouble himself that much. I'm not worthy. Do you notice the contrast? Right, the Jewish elders, the leaders, they were pleading with Jesus on the basis of of saying, this man is worthy, he's done enough things, he's been faithful enough, he's given enough, he built the synagogue. But he says, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. Right, there's some recognition in this man, I'm not worthy. This, it wouldn't even be right for you to be in my home. But... As he says that, he's not asking Jesus to just leave and go away. Notice what he says. He says, just say the word. Jesus, just tell Jesus to say the word. He doesn't have to come here. If he just says the word, my servant will be healed. It's incredible faith. He said, and then he he gives a, a... an explanation. He says, I too am a man placed under authority. He says, I am a man who has been, gi- I am under authority. I have been given authority by those over me for the realm of my responsibility. 
He says, I have soldiers under my command, and when I tell them to go, they go, because they are under my authority. And when I tell them to come, they come. If I tell my servant to do something, they do it. And this is an expression of incredible faith, because what he's saying is that I recognize, I don't fully understand who Jesus is. I don't think he did yet. Even the disciples did. But I recognize this man, Jesus. He has authority. He couldn't do the things that he does. He couldn't speak the things that he speaks if he didn't have authority. I know he has authority. And I know he believed that that authority came from God. And so he says, you have the authority, the power to do this thing. You don't have to come here. You just merely need to say the word. And notice Jesus' response. It's really the whole point. You know, as, as, as different stories are told, they, they each have a unique point. And the point of the story, the focus is not actually on the healing, which will happen. We get very little detail about that. But notice verse 9. Jesus heard this and, notice, was amazed at him. Jesus, now Luke uses this word amazed to describe Jesus in response to this this Roman centurion. It says, Jesus was amazed at him. He marveled and he turned to the crowd, right, that was following him. And he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. Jesus was amazed by this man. It's extraordinary, isn't it? A Roman centurion, a Gentile, an outsider. And yet Jesus marvels, is amazed at his faith. And what was it about his faith that amazed Jesus? It's a question we should ask. Why was he amazed? What amazed him? And I believe it was his willingness to acknowledge his unworthiness and yet still have the faith to ask Jesus anyway. You see, whether he knew the Hebrew word or not, this man understood chesed. He understood that he did not deserve anything from God. He knew that he was unworthy. He knew he didn't deserve it. But he had the audacity, he had the faith to ask Jesus That's a response to God's chesed. He had no right to expect anything, yet he asks for everything. You see, the elders, the Jewish leaders, thought that that Jesus should honor the request because he had earned it or deserved it. But this man knew, I haven't earned anything. I don't deserve anything. But I can ask anyone. Chesed is part of who God is. It is what he does. It's what he wants us to experience. It's something that we are called to sing about and to express. It's something we're called to reciprocate in our lives, and we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. But it also is something that should shape our faith and our confidence and our trust in God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. It's a simple, short little verse. And it says, we love, and this is John writing later in his life, right? The apostle John, the disciple, the one who had been called as a teenager, most likely an older teenager to be a follower of Jesus, to be one of his disciples. He became one of the inner, inner circle. He was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw the miracles. He heard the message. And this is what John says. He says, we love because he first loved us. He says, we love, we love God because he first loved us. We were just fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, and Jesus called us, and he redeemed us. And not only that, but he washed our feet. It was crazy. And then he died, and he rose from the dead, and we understood that he loved us. And when you understand 
God's chesed, his covenant love, his faithful love, his loyal love. When you grasp it, and, and that's something that takes a lifetime. I don't think we can pretend that any of us grasp it fully, that any of us understand it completely. I don't think we ever will in this life. But as we go deeper into God's love, as we go deeper into an encounter and an experience with who he is, what he's done for us, and who we are now because of that, when we understand that, it will strengthen our faith and give us the confidence to pray bold prayers of faith. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever rung a doorbell or knocked on a door and were very tentative or hesitant because you didn't know who was going to come, if they wanted to see you, and it was a little bit nerve-wracking? Anybody have that experience? All right, most all of us. Right? We, all, we all can identify with that I don't know, I don't know how this is going to go, right? You ring the doorbell and you step back a few steps, right? You you knock, but you're not sure you actually knocked loud enough for them to hear, but you're not sure you really wanted them to hear. Are you with me? And sometimes we can think that that's how I have to approach God. Is God going to accept me? Is God okay with this prayer? How, how How can I approach God? But I want you to know that because of God's chesed, because of his faithful, loyal, covenant love, because the one from whom you deserve nothing delights to give you everything, you don't have to knock hesitantly when you pray. And you don't have to be nervous about whether he will accept you, whether he will hear you or listen to you. Because God invites you to come to him. And the basis for you coming to him is never, ever your worthiness or deservedness. It's never because you've been really good or you've done the things. You know, sometimes we think that we can manipulate God. Some of you know how to manipulate your parents. We're not going to get into that this morning. And maybe you can, but you can't manipulate God. I used to think that that's how it worked. I remember when I was in the beginning of grad school, and, and most of my friends were either uh, dating seriously, engaged, or married, and I was quite single and lamenting it. And I remember thinking, God, why? God, why, why, why am I single and my friends? And I would be such a good boyfriend. I'd be such a good fiance. I'd be the best husband ever. Come to find out, I wasn't. But that's another story for another day. But I remember, I remember, it, it, not consciously, but subconsciously think, God, I'm doing the right things. I, I have... <coughs> A quiet time in the morning, I I meet with you. I'm seeking you. I'm I'm trying to follow you and serve you. And why are you not fulfilling this desire? And there was a moment, it's actually in a church service, a sermon that I heard on Exodus chapter 13 and 14. And the pastor entitled that sermon, Detours, Dead Ends, and Dry Holes. And he talked about how God leads his people. right? How God rescued his people out of Egypt. And he led them in a way that didn't make any sense. In fact, it led them to a place where they felt trapped. They were trapped. The Red Sea in front of them, mountains on either side, and the armies of Egypt behind them. And they had nowhere to look except up and to trust God. And, and even through then, it was a, such a long journey, and most always because of their own sin. But God used that moment to help me understand that I could trust God, that I can't manipulate God, and it's not about ever me deserving something from God. And of course, by God's grace, I realized that God did have a good plan for my life. And then a year or two after that, I met my now current wife. We've been married for 20 years. I just didn't know she was five years younger than me, and I had to wait. All right? So you can't always understand what God's doing. But you have the right, you have the ability to ask God boldly, not because you deserve it, not because you can manipulate him, not say, God, I'm doing all the things. I practiced two hours today. God, hear my prayer. It's not how it works. Now, you should practice. But God won't hear your prayers on the basis of your practice time. He invites you to come confidently. Luke chapter 11. Just listen if you'd like. Jesus says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, he will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, we should all find God's 
mercy and his grace, his kindness, his loyal love, his faithfulness. We should find all of that. We should find him amazing. And we should stand amazed by him. And that should never fade. Right? We should never get over it what God has done for us. We should never get over who he is. In fact, it should be an increasingly uh, growing experience in our life that we go to deeper and deeper levels of amazement of who he is, of his love, of his mercy. But I want us to just wrestle about how can we, how can you amaze Jesus? And it's not through your talents and your abilities and your performance Those things are are good, but they don't amaze Jesus. He's the one who gave you those talents and those abilities. But what amazes Jesus, as we see in Luke chapter 7, is faith. And a faith that understands that although I deserve nothing, God is willing to give me everything. There are two things that I think that stand out. Number one, the centurion's understanding of his unworthiness. He deeply understood, I'm not worthy. And all of us need to understand that. We need to understand that. I was thinking about the old hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And one verse says this. It says, Upon the cross of Jesus, my eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonder of redeeming love and my unworthiness. We're not worthy. We're not worthy of anything. But Jesus is worthy, and he has clothed you in his right. If you're in Christ, if you know Jesus, he has clothed you in his righteousness. He has clothed you in his worthiness. And it's on the basis of his worthiness and his righteousness that although we in ourselves have no right to ask, he invites us to come and boldly ask. Number two, the centurion's willingness Right. He understood his unworthiness, but then it was his willingness to ask Jesus anyway. His willingness to ask Jesus anyway. He had faith to ask the one from whom he deserved nothing for the very thing he desired. I believe that God is looking for people. He's looking for his children who will have that kind of faith. Because God works through the prayers of his people. Prayer is an extraordinary mystery but it is a powerful reality that God has ordained not only for us to express our worship to him as we praise him. It's not only an avenue to thank him. It is not only an avenue to lament before him, which we are invited to do and to pour out our hearts and our troubles and our pain and our sorrow. But it is also an avenue to ask for God's purposes to come to pass in our lives and on this earth. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? God does not need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need my prayers. But yet God has ordained, he's chosen to use the prayers of his people to accomplish his purposes on earth. When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? One of the the first things he told them, as he said, first of all, start off by acknowledging who God is and start off in worship. But then he says, pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, right? Your kingdom come, your rule and reign. May your rule and reign come in my life and in my heart. May your will be done, your purposes. May they come to pass on earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's a beautiful verse. He says, when we learn to delight ourselves in God, that he gives us the ability to pray for the desires of our heart and to see those things come to pass. God, he begins to put his desires, his purposes in our heart, and we get to pray for them. And so I just want to invite you today to know that you can boldly come to God in prayer. You can knock without hesitation. You can ring the doorbell, and you can expect that you will never, ever, ever be rejected or denied. And so I just want to ask you this question. Is there a place in your life right now that you're desperate for God to work in? Right, this, this Roman centurion, he was desperate. His servant that he loved, that he cared for, was dying. And in his desperation, he called out to God. Sent a message to Jesus. Is there something that you're desperate for? Maybe it's a physical situation, a physical need. Maybe it's a financial need in your family. Maybe it's a battle that you're facing. I know a lot of us face battles that are unseen. 
Right? I, I have walked through the valley of anxiety. I know what that's like, even to a point where it's quite crippling for a time. The valley of depression or discouragement. Those things are very real. And I want to invite you, and I'm not suggesting that you can, no, don't, do not hear me say you can pray that away, right? In the sense that I'm not saying there's a magic prayer that can make your problems go away. But I also don't want you to discount what God can do. I know in those seasons I called out to God and there were times that that anxiety was so overwhelming and I prayed and, and and I would open my eyes hoping that it was gone. Have you ever been there? Because I knew that God could do it in a moment. I knew that God, if he, if he chose to, he could take it away like that. And I'd open my eyes and I thought, nope, still here. But you know what? God did hear that prayer. God wasn't aloof. God wasn't distant. He wasn't uncaring. He wasn't unkind. He had a purpose in that valley. He had a reason. And God did answer those prayers, and he did lift me up out of that valley. And his healing in that area in my life is still ongoing. It's not something that is just gone, but his healing is real. Maybe it's a friend or a relative that's far from God. Maybe you say, man, I have a parent, I have a brother, I have a sister, I have a friend that is far from God, and you're burdened for them. Maybe it's a family situation that's broken. Whatever it is, I want to invite you to pray from the same posture as this Roman centurion, recognizing that in and of myself, I don't have the right to ask for anything I'm not worthy, but because of Jesus, because of his love, I can boldly ask. Not only just for ourselves, but we look at our world, we see the brokenness of our world. We see the lostness of our world. And God, I believe, is looking to raise up a generation of people who will pray for his purposes to come to pass on this earth. And God's wanting to use you, and there's nothing, nothing more powerful than prayer. I I am largely standing here this morning because of the prayers of my mom who prayed for me so faithfully. Not that God would just save me, but that he would call me into ministry. And she never told me about that until after I surrendered to Jesus. Prayer is so, so powerful. Not everything that we want, not all of our whims, right? God's not going to answer always in the way that we think or want. But God does delight to hear your prayers, and he does answer them. And on the basis of his chesed, you can come to him and ask him boldly. I want to close just very, very briefly the hymn that we sang to open chapel this morning, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. It was written by a woman named Louisa Steed, or Stead. She was born in England, had a passion to be a missionary. She came to America, but because of her health, she was not able to go to the mission field. She married a man and had a daughter. They lived in Long Island, New York, and one day they went to the beach. And while they were there, a young boy was in the water struggling against the current. Her husband jumped up and raced to the ocean to try to rescue him, but they both drowned. And this was in the late 1800s. This was in a time where it was very hard for a female who was now single to support herself or care for herself. And in the the rawness of her grief, and her emotions, and learning that she had to trust God in a way she never did before, she penned those words that we sang, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." I want you to know that you can trust him. God eventually gave her the grace to go to Africa to fulfill the desires of her heart. She remarried. She served in two different countries. And it was said at the time of her death that this song was sung all over Africa in the countries where she served, in Zimbabwe and in South Africa. But that last line said, oh, that last, that last hint, that last verse begins this way. Oh, for, or in that last verse, it says, oh, for grace to trust him more. Let's ask God for that. Would you let me pray for you? Father, I know that there are probably some very heavy things represented by all of us in this room. And Father, I just pray this morning that, that anyone who's bearing a heavy burden would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them, that you see them and that your faithfulness is still towards them, I pray that they would have the courage and the faith to ask you to work in that place and that the basis of their prayer would not just be that, God, I deserve this, but God, I don't deserve this, but would you do it anyway? And Father, I pray that we would not only pray for ourselves, but that we would seek to pray for your purposes to come to pass on this earth. Use this generation in a powerful way 
to bring your purposes to pass. Father, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.